We've all got old laptops and computers lying around waiting to be scrapped. But can you turn them into something useful? Let's have a go at making a microcontroller development system out of this old 2009 netbook. Hi and welcome to Bites and Bits. I was clearing out one of my cupboards the other day and I came across an old laptop. So this is an Asus EPC and it's from around about 2010 when a lot of these little netbook computers were coming onto the market. Um, now even when I bought this at the time it still wasn't a very powerful machine at that point. So it was built around an Intel Celeron M353 processor running at 900 megahertz. Um, it initially came with one gigabyte of RAM, but I've upgraded this over the years to two gigabytes, and, and that's the maximum that it can take. And it also then has a 16 gigabyte SSD, but believe me, this is a very slow SSD inside here. So, so mine came installed with Windows XP, and it was just about capable of running that for simple office tasks. Now, I'm sure if most of us look around in our cupboards and we'll find similar old machines lying around gathering dust. Now, these obviously won't run the more modern versions of Windows or Linux, but it does seem a shame to simply scrap them, especially once they're in such a nice, neat package. So, what can you do with a very low-powered laptop? So, so in this video, I'm going to be setting this laptop up as a development system for coding the Raspberry Pi Pico in MicroPython, and as an Arduino IDE-based development system for coding in C++. Now, this can turn it into a very useful tool, allowing you to have a dedicated machine for your project area, or, or if your kids want to have a go at making projects, um, this will then, of course, let them have their own personal laptop without tying up your main development system. So let's rebuild this laptop with some new software. The first job is to get the EPC up and running with an up-to-date operating system. Now, Windows is completely out of the question. Uh, even if we go back to Windows 98 or even 95, we might get okay performance, um, but most of our software will just not work. So some version of Linux is going to be the best bet. Now, the full desktop Linux will probably need newer and better hardware. So as I said, I've only got two gigabytes of RAM, uh, and that is the maximum that this machine can handle. So most and distributions will probably fail to install. But there is a very active community developing Linux distros tailored to these lower powered machines. With the rise in single board computers such as the Raspberry Pi, light versions of Linux are essential. Indeed, I had actually installed a version of Raspberry Pi OS on this EPC a couple of years ago, and, and that gave me a Linux-based laptop that I could just pull out whenever I needed one. So the, the Raspberry Pi desktop is an option, but even this is starting to need better performing hardware to give it a usable experience. So we can look at a number of other Linux distros to really bring the hardware requirements down. Now, there are a wide range to choose from, but I've settled on Lubuntu as it's one of the more mature versions and it takes the minimum requirement right down to an Intel Pentium 2 or Celeron processor with only 128 megabytes of RAM and 2 gigabytes of hard disk space. And that, of course, is well inside the spec of this EPC. So if you head over to the main Lubuntu website, you'll find that the main download is for the 64-bit version. Now, my EPC running on this Celeron M353, it does only have 32-bit architecture. So um, when you are downloading for your own laptop, do make sure you check what sort of hardware specs you have and make sure that you get the right download version. But once that's downloaded, um, you simply need to turn it onto an SD card or a USB stick. Uh, and both the Raspberry Pi Imager app or, or the Belena Etcher app make this process very simple. Now, once you've got the disk image ready, you need to work out then how to get your laptop to boot from USB. Now, if you power on the machine, usually on the post screen, you'll see that it says that you can press a particular function key to get you into the BIOS setup screen. And if you go in there, usually you can change the boot order to boot from the USB drive first. 
Or, or like me, if you have one of these EPCs, then all you need to do is, while the machine is turning on, just press the escape key, and that will take you into a boot menu. And from there, you can then select the USB drive. But, but either way you do it, um, put in your SD card or your USB um, flash drive, power up the laptop, and get it to boot from that USB drive. So setting up Lubuntu is, is very straightforward. Um, initially, of course, it will ask you to get your disk drive set up. Um, but the easiest way here is to just simply delete all the existing partitions and then tell Lubuntu to use the entire disk for this new installation. And after that, you simply need to work through things like the region settings, connecting up your Wi-Fi or Ethernet network, and then just let it run its course to install the whole um, operating system. As it goes through, there'll be a couple of points where you'll be asked to make a decision, um, such as the Grub bootloader, um, but just accept the recommended options and, and let Ubuntu then set all that up for you. Now, once the operating system is installed, you should be able to boot up and log into your new laptop. So mine immediately prompted me to update the software, um, so I let that run through as well. Now, now all of this setup, um, it probably took me about an hour to complete due to the slowness of this EPC, but you can mostly leave the install just running and pop back now and again to check if it needs any input from you. So now that we've got the operating system in place, it's time to get some software onto the machine. So for Python and MicroPython development, and, and to be able to use the Raspberry Pi Pico, I'm going to install Thony. Now, now Thony is a very basic Python and MicroPython development system, and it's the one that is promoted actually by the Raspberry Pi Foundation, because um, it is very closely linked into the Raspberry Pi Pico, and it'll make it very easy for you to program and, and maintain that uh, microcontroller board. Now I found that the standard install using the package manager in Lubuntu, um, that wanted to download an older version. And, and indeed the Thony website does warn that package managers will tend to do that. But there is a, a set of instructions on the Thony website that shows you how to download and manually install the latest version. Now, now this does involve using a bash command, and as default, the, the bash app is not installed in Lubuntu, at least, at least it wasn't installed in mine. So first of all, I needed to install bash, um, just using the command sudo apt install bash. And once that was in, then I could use the command as listed on the Thony website, and that allowed me then to download and install the application. So once that was all installed, um, the Thony software put itself a shortcut on my desktop and of course added itself to the programming menu on the um, Lubuntu start menu. Now I also want to have this system to work with Arduinos. So um, we'll need to use the Arduino IDE and set that up so that we can then program in C++. Now, installing the Arduino IDE in Linux um, does require you to download, extract, and then in, uh, run an install script. But the Arduino um, website does have a very easy to follow tutorial on how to do this. So please do have a look at this website. And again, all of these links and commands and so on, I'll, I'll link to my main project page on my bytesandbits.co.uk website. So you can get all of that information there. Now, as we've actually just installed a full Linux desktop, the easiest way to get hold of this one is to actually do it through the built-in browser, um, which on Lubuntu here is Firefox. Now, it, it's not performing fantastically well here, but it is good enough to go to websites such as the Arduino website and to then click through and download files from there. So again, if once you've downloaded the file, you can simply then use the File Manager app to find that file, open it, and then drag the contents into some folder. Um, and then you can then open that up and you'll find the install.sh file inside there. So if you double click on that, you can then run it in the terminal and that will then install the Arduino IDE for you and put some shortcuts onto your desktop. So that's the software now in place. Um, but before we can actually use the development system, we need to make one change to our account settings. 
As you can see on the screen, the TTY ports, which are the USB ports, are owned by the Dialout group. And we're not yet a member of that group, so we haven't got permission to use these USB ports for communication. And we're going to need that when we want to program our Pico and Arduino boards. So we're going to need to open up a terminal window and then use this following command. Of course, replacing username with your Lubuntu account name. And of course, that is the first part of the text you can see on your console command line. And this will basically add you to the dialout group, which is the one that has ownership of the USB ports. So once we've got ourselves added to that group, and really everything is now in place to work with our microcontroller projects. So if we boot up Thonny, um, you can see there that we can plug in our Raspberry Pi Pico and that it very easily then connects to that and we can download some software such as the simple Blink application. And then going into the Arduino IDE, again, there's no problem at all here connecting with the board and downloading and running our, our development software on that as well. And then both of these applications then don't put a lot of pressure on the processor or RAM. So they're going to work as well here as they really do anywhere else. So that really gives you a full Linux laptop for developing your projects and doing a bit of light coding. Um, but you might also think that you would want to use this then for some other tasks. Uh, to be honest though, you'll probably find that this isn't going to be a pleasant experience. Browsing on the web is okay, as long as you avoid any sites that try to run any sort of application code. YouTube works at a snail's pace, and in fact, I haven't actually managed to get through the initial startup screen, so I don't know how well the videos actually play, but it just takes too long to get there, even to begin starting to play them. Simple office apps will be okay, um, but again, you're most likely going to use your main PC for these. So Lubuntu does come bundled with a, a simple word processor and spreadsheet package. Um, but again, it's there if you need it, but I would not expect you to really use that. So for me, this setup is ideal as a small, dedicated project development system. It sits in my project area, um, and it also then gives me a Linux machine if ever I need to do something um, from that environment. So that's one use for this old laptop. As I said at the beginning, um, I'm going to have a look at a couple of uses of this over a couple of videos. So in the next one, we're actually going to take this past back past the Windows area and build up a true MS-DOS machine. And in that way, we'll should be able to play all of the old retro PC games. Because al although this is what we would term today a very low-powered machine, if you compare it back to the sort of the mid-90s, um, this is actually quite a powerful little device. So I hope you find this tutorial useful and that you can get some use out of your old laptops. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe to my channel to get all the latest tutorials on making, coding and gaming as I publish them. I look forward to seeing you again very soon and bye for now. For more games programming, electronics projects and retro gaming, please make sure you like this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel and visit my website.